straight to Dr. Eric Liebeck, who's Presidential Fellow at the Manchester Institute of Education, University of Manchester. Uh, Eric, over to you. Hi, hello. Um, thank you for having me at this um, event. I am going to approach the angle of financial sustainability uh, from a different angle, which is not necessarily the one of the institutions and how they would survive within the current funding environment, but actually address the uh, unsustainability of the funding system and the sector as a whole. So that's kind of what I'm going to approach. And I'm going to suggest an alternative drawing on some of the new ideas around the civic university and point out that um, while it's an, a nice uh, addition to the disc discourse around higher education, uh, the current ideas of civic universities don't go enough. So I'm going to suggest why that's the case. Oh, now, let's see, going down. So essentially, there's, there's sort of two major funding models, and, and the main one that we tend to use in um, English-speaking countries are the liberal, there's a kind of liberal political assumption around what higher education is for. And in that instance, you have the student who's down there on the on the bottom right who goes to university up, up above him and more or less buys a degree that gives him some sort of an advantage, a graduate premium on the market. And uh, the value of the degree is the value of that graduate premium. And that's, that's the kind of liberal model and that's more or less shared on both the center right and the center left of the political spectrum, the sort of um, liberal conservative wing, as well as the kind of new labor uh, sort of progressive modernizer, as opposed to the more further left um, model, which is represented uh, in this instance by the kind of social model, which in the farthest extent is a socialist model. But there's also a sort of social liberal model, which is essentially saying that society needs graduates rather than individuals, and therefore we should fund the university uh, as a public good, and then we just figure out who should go to that public university. And the criticisms of that are that, you know, you might have to put caps on things. Um, it, it makes the whole system rather vulnerable to political um, decisions. So, for example, if there's a budget crisis, do they cut places for universities? So institutions have generally preferred the liberal model in the sense that, you know, they can uh, they can rely on individual students and 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 worry about marketing to them, uh, and and the social model is sort of a it's sort of a hybrid at the moment because you do have certain ways in which the kind of widening participation agenda or general skills upgrading do inform current um, sector policy, but it's done so through the liberal mechanism, in particular since you have uh, the student loan and fee system where, where every the unit of resource is, is down to the individual student and attracting them. And what I'm suggesting is actually that both of these are, are sort of in crisis. And in the same way, the, the pandemic has, has led to that crisis, but it's actually a longer time in coming. So the, the, the longer term crisis that this is kind of um, being affected is, is the general crisis in liberalism that we've seen play out again in Anglophone countries, but you could see this in a wider international context, uh, beginning with the Brexit vote, beginning with the Trump vote. And essentially what you have is a democratic populist um, resentment of elites. And higher education and the support for higher education policy and funding is tied up in that resentment. And you can see certain ways in which the, the current conservative party is trying to play into that by saying, well, we're going to cut three-year degrees, we're going to add to FE, even down to the level of higher education is full of woke sorcerers or whatever it is that they are saying these days. Um, there's a kind of sense in which there's the population, or at least 50% of the population, actually has had enough, not just with higher education, but with the professional middle classes in general. And so that's kind of the, the real inflection point. 
So the pandemic is only one piece of this, but coming out of that, we do have to acknowledge that this is actually the context in which we would be lobbying for more funding for the sector. So um, what might be a, a, a way of thinking about this differently? Now, the first thing we can do is think about, okay, well, we are using the liberal model right now to fund the sector. So that's the individuals buying their degrees. Now, there's a number of ways in which liberalism presents a certain number of fictions, Meritocracy is one in the fact that, you know, there's a huge sense in which social backgrounds actually influence outcomes. So to use any of the kind of economistic um, accounting systems where you're valuing degrees according to earnings, it's actually, I mean, that that it's essentially, um, you know, it's a mythology. It's, it's not actually represented in any reality and, and actually the entire office for students runs on this model. But okay, let's pretend that that's actually a real thing. Even that uh, the, the individual student who's paying 9,000 pounds a year is not actually funding the entire institution that they're getting that, um, that education from. So the institution is running essentially at a loss. So you have to bring in on the top, I've got grad, uh, International students, especially from China, are subsidizing the institution. You also have technology and kind of advanced um, UKRI, Innovate UK, these kind of like larger scale technology and science policy is also funding, especially Russell Group and research intensive universities. And finally, you have knowledge exchange and the potential to work together. And that's the point that knowledge exchange is where I think the current discourse around civic universities is basically presuming we'll add a bit more of that kind of local interaction between universities and societies. And that might be a way in which you can kind of ameliorate some of this resentment coming from the populist as well as accommodate a, a different tone from government. Now, what I'm going to suggest is actually you, we need a much bigger alternative vision for the civic university where the university is not just an isolated institution in which there's sort of students uh, coming in and out. And um, rather what we need is a university that's embedded in all of the different regions. So uh, we need a much more localized organization, uh, geographic Keynesianism, uh, would be a, a, a bit of a nice return. And then that university is embedded in the economic system, the local government and politics, as well as the family structures and uh, different uh, multi-cultural uh, communities and, and so forth, and, and becomes a, a, a sort of hub in the reorganization of especially left behind regions, post-industrial regions, uh, urban uh, deprived areas. And then think about this much more in a kind of uh, local civic ecological way rather than uh, this, this idea that there's individual students that we need to sell our goods to and so on. I just don't think that that's going to work any longer. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave my time there. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Well, two uh, contrasting presentations. And uh, I very much look forward to questions coming in on them just in the few minutes we've got. That's while I wait to see if more questions are arriving, I might make a couple of comments of my own. I mean, first of all, on, on Sam's presentation from KPMG, I think uh, what surprises me about the past six months is that compared with some of the worst anxieties about the financial position of universities, I think whilst they have been under pressure, um, I would argue that it has ended up that the financial pressures have perhaps not been quite as acute as was feared, um, including uh, overseas students, uh, some of them still coming to Britain and others still subscribing to their courses in other ways. So whilst I have no illusions, universities are under financial pressure, uh, my, my impression is that it's not quite as acute as was feared. Um, and in terms of the repertoire of options which um, we were taken through, um, I said at the time to ministers, it did, it did occur to me that whilst they were looking at a university in extremis 
having essentially sort of to trade down to being an FE college, the element that they also needed to factor in was the international interest in uh, uni British universities, including overseas investors and buyers. And in the pri amongst private universities, we've seen two um, change hands in the past 12 months. Um, and I think that there is still potential for overseas investors to come in in partnership with British universities to help operate uh, departments to um, invest substantially because British universities are still very highly regarded internationally. Um, on Dr. Liebeck's presentation, I guess I thought that the, the contrast between the two extremes of the liberal model and the, and the kind of old uh, public service model um, left the kind of reforms I brought in, I thought rather happily in the middle, which is that yes, there is an element of, uh, of personal payment by graduates, not of course by students, if they are in well-paid jobs, reflecting fact that, that by and large graduates do earn more than non-graduates. Um, but it is not a, an exclusively liberal model. And the, because if a graduate is not in a well-paid job, uh, then the generality of taxpayers pay through writing off his or her repayments. Now, exactly how much that should be. The, the notorious RAB charge is actually a, a deliberate and intended feature of the system. I personally think the RAB charge is now too high. So that element of taxpayer write-off too high and the element, element of graduate repayment too low because the repayment threshold was put up so much. But it's it can be calibrated. Uh, I think every few years there should be a review and strike a balance between taxpayer support, um, which reflects the fact that there are wider public benefits from universities and it is not reasonable to expect low paid graduates to pay back. Uh, and the and the graduate repayment element, which reflects the fact there are also personal and private benefits. It is um, universities are good for individuals and good for society. And so taxpayers pay meet some of the costs and well paid graduates meet some of the costs. Um, my view is that that is actually a stable and very viable um, compromise, which uh, will be fought over at the margin, exactly what the balance is between the two, shown in the exact size of the RAB charge, which is a healthy discussion to have on which different people have different views. Uh, but I don't detect any great willingness to... has come in um, and of course panelists might want to comment what I might what I myself have said but also what are the panelists comments on the view of many students that the barrier to access for many home students is not tuition fees but the cost of living uh, and of course it's correct student tuition fees are not a barrier because there's no student uh, need pay that up front no UK student it is I'm all of my conversations with the NUS what they focused on was the cash pressures on people whilst at university. And I rather agreed with their analysis. Um, so why don't we go to Sam first and then Eric. Sam, your observations, both on that question and on my comments. Well, I mean, there's quite, quite a lot to unpick there. Thank you. Um, I suppose on, on, on the question in particular, it's, it's, a really interest, it's a really interesting sort of topic that comes up you know, an awful lot. What I what I don't have an answer to, but would love to have an answer to, is unpicking the extent to which um, barriers to entry to education are formed by perceptions and you know uh, legacy perceptions handed down from parents and other people, and how much are borne out by um, real uh, life experiences and doing the mathematics, if you like. Um, I, I don't want to get into the debate around the horrible debate around Mickey Mouse degrees, therefore not paying back and things like this, but certainly um, you know. As a as a first generation university goer, the, f the first university goer in my um, uh, family, and but thankfully somebody who uh, had the the fortuitous uh, good fortune to be born in 1979 and therefore go to university when I didn't have to pay for things, I still managed to rack up an enormous amount of debt, and I've always seen sort of the debt that I racked up as uh, sort of part and parcel of something that I would you know I would gain benefit from going forward. So. Um, uh, you know, it's very difficult, obviously, to speak for everybody in these situations, but I think it's an incredibly nuanced uh, 
topic of debate, which which owes a lot to the reality of cost now being much higher, but also perceptions around cost, which are, I think, in many respects, uh, sort of passed down through generations. Yeah, of course, in 1979, many fewer people went. So the, young, the later generation in this respect have a model that enables far higher participation. We should forget all those young people in 1979 who did go to university, who in 2020 would go to university. They're an important part of the argument. Eric, over to you. Yes, um, very, very good questions. Um, and, and I think I would agree with you that the, the coalition or, or your uh, policy in 2010 probably was in the middle uh, as, as most of the kind of um, post-1980 uh, higher education funding model is is a kind of combination of balancing those individual and and sort of social functions. But I think the point at which I I would be disagreeing is is both the social and the liberal models have an idea that the purpose of higher education is for national pub, um, economic growth, and so therefore the public is investing in that for the purpose of of having a knowledgeable workforce and and so forth, and I think that that's a, a very good goal. Um, but I think that the the conflict I was pointing to is that helps the fifty percent of the population who go to university, and there needs to be a case made to the population that doesn't that this knowledgeable class of of uh, graduates. Are putting things in the right, moving things in the right direction, uh, running government well, running health services, education, all of these things well, and I don't think that trust is there uh, for a large number of reasons. But the reason why I think that it makes more sense to not think of this any longer from a national point of view, but from a local, regional point of view, is you could start to think about. Okay, we were talking earlier about the. Um, the student's impact on society, um, you know, the, what, are, what are the effects of student accommodation blocks coming up in certain regions, uh, displacing poor populations who then resent the university in their own place? Those are, those are conversations that we don't have often enough. Um, and what we could do is if local governments were funded to the, a full extent, then you could start to think about, well, how could the university be embedded in a, in a much more holistic cycle of satisfying local needs, satisfying global research needs, bringing those into communities. And that's something that I think is possible if we made an effort to do it. But I don't presently see the, the education department um, making such efforts at the, at the moment. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much for that observation. And I'm advisor to the Civic University cause, and uh, certainly I think one of the, actually one of the silver linings to the cloud of this virus, it probably has strengthened universities' awareness of their civic roots and civic um, obligations. I'm just looking to see, there's, there's, been, there's one other question. Um, and it's about whether students, do we think, are viewing themselves more as consumers? Any very quick comments for Sam and then Eric on that? Just, just one for me. This, this came up, this came up twice recently in uh, uh, executive and governing body meetings I've attended where um, uh, senior individuals have questioned that and a student has been in the room and said, no, I'm paying a lot of money. <laughs> quite right part of course the student isn't personally paying at that point but it is absolutely right part of the idea was that it empowered the student voice they're at least responsible for bringing a, a pot of money individually into the university a fantastic way of empowering the student uh, eric your comments? um i think that i think imagining the student as a consumer has not been great for universities i think that they invest in the wrong things because they're imagining a consumer student. I think the actual consumers are families and taxpayers and that it makes more sense to think about their needs. Um, and and um, so I think you might see complaints that are framed in terms of I'm paying 9,000 pounds and you see that a lot 
in during the pandemic. I personally don't think that students should have paid anything this year, but um, in in terms of the the actual, but they are actually receiving an education online. I think it makes much more sense to obtain a refund on accommodation before we start talking about consumer refunds because they have received um, a good quality education this year, um, and I assume they will in the future. Thank you very much. Well, we are getting to the end of this session. I'm I'm going to indulge very briefly in a, in a final comment prompted by what we've we've just heard by referring people back to my own book on the subject. I was looking whilst Eric was talking to my uh, a book, a university education, um, which includes a table of what or a little illustration of what I called a quadrant of the benefits of university, and there are individual benefits, and there are social benefits. That's one axis. The other axis, there are economic benefits and there are non-economic benefits. And I, that makes a quadrant, and I argue that we've got all four. There are individual economic benefits. You tend to earn more. There are individual non-economic benefits. You're likely to live longer. There are economic benefits that accrue to society as a whole. More better educated people is good for economic growth as a whole. Um, and there are wider social benefits for society as a whole. Uh, graduates being more likely to uh, vote in elections, for example. Um, and I think a lesson, I argue, a lesson we can learn from the campaigners for the early years, the first three years, is that we, I think we waste too much time arguing about the relative weight and relative value of those four different types of benefits. Um, and instead, individuals can have their own weighting and, and uh, perhaps Eric and... Sam and myself might have different personal weightings, but I think we can at least exist that there is robust empirical evidence that all four exist uh, and a good thing too. And it's probably why we're going to carry on having a mixed funding mechanism for higher education as well. But I'm grateful to Sam Sanders. I'm grateful to Eric Liebeck. Thank you all for attending. I'm now bowing out as chair of this session and um, there will now be a break until 11.25 when the conference will resume and for the latter half chaired by Fleur Anderson MP who is a member of the Education Select Committee. Thank you to all our presenters and panellists so far. Thanks very much indeed.